Okay, cool. Um, it is eight o'clock, so I guess we will get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Together Tuesday, uh, a live stream event hosted by the University College Literary and Athletic Society here at U of T, um, otherwise known as the UC Lit. Um, this is kind of a part of our summer virtual event programming, so thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Sophia, and I will be one of your moderators today along with Alex. Um, today we'll be having a discussion with some wonderful climate activists at U of T and discussing with them what it means to be a climate activist um, of our age and, our, and in our generation. Uh, their personal experience with climate activism, the challenges associated with the work, and how people can get more involved. Uh, before we go any further, uh, we at the Sustainability Commission would like to acknowledge the land on which U of T operates. The land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. My name is Alex Levike. I am a 22nd generation Canadian, and I'm currently living on unceded Indigenous land. I'm a descendant of settlers, as my father's family's lineage can be traced back to the first French people to, to arrive in Canada from France. Although I've never personally grown up in Canada and I'm therefore not very familiar with Indigenous history, I commit to learning more about and advocating as the best ally as I can be for Indigenous autonomy and land sovereignty. Canada's long history of cultural genocide has resulted in profound Indigenous suffering, and I must act as an agent for change. As a settler descendant, I'm aware of my history and I'm fully obligated to support Indigenous communities in their attempt to reclaim land and culture. For more Indigenous history in Toronto and Toronto land acknowledgements, um, see the link my fellow moderator will be sending onto the chat right now. Cool, thank you, Alex. Um, before we start, uh, we would like to cover some uh, basic housekeeping items. Um, the live stream will be approximately um, an hour, including this introduction. Uh, about 35 minutes of discussion with our panelists and hopefully some time at the end uh, for our panelists to answer some audience questions. Uh, please direct any of your questions into the YouTube live chat and we will make a note of them. Uh, we will also post a compilation of any mentioned resources as well as our respective socials on our Facebook event page for those who want to reach out and get involved. Uh, the UC Lit does not tolerate hate or discriminatory speech of any kind and moderators will ban those who are maliciously disruptive. Um, okay, and since that's out of the way, we can get started. Uh, we'll, start, we'll start with some introductions. Um, I will start. Um, hi everyone, my name is Sophia. Uh, I go by she, her pronouns. I'm going into my fourth year in ecology and evolutionary biology, and I'm your sustainability commissioner here at the UC Lit. Uh, this is my second year in the position, and I think it's safe to say that I'm learning new things on the job every day. Uh, the commission is here to represent student concerns, um, especially UC students on sustainability issues within our college and beyond, uh, whether that be in the form of resources, um, events and actions, or new council sustainability policies, we kind of do everything related. Uh, one of my personal goals for this year um, is to involve the commission in more politically consequential issues um, beyond the DIY and kind of BYOC events the commission was known for in the past, and to decenter kind of this narrative of sustainability um, off of lifestyle and onto more climate advocacy and justice. Um, because one cannot be an environmental uh, advocacy or sustainability group without also addressing the civil and human rights issues that are inseparable within the climate emergency. Um, to do this, collaborating with other environmental justice groups in and around U of T is super important, uh, which is why I'm really glad to have some, to have some of these awesome people here uh, today from LEAP U of T, uh, UTEA, and USAC Sustainability to talk about their work and experiences. So uh, let's keep going with some more introductions, um, starting off with my co-moderator, Alex. Hi everyone, my name is Alex and I use he, him pronouns. I'm going into my second year in sociology and political science. My majors have greatly influenced my choice to become involved in the Sustainability Commission. I believe uh, that climate change is something that intersects with many facets in our society. In my classes, we talk about all sorts of isms and while all are important in and of themselves, um, it's important to acknowledge that climate change is rooted in a power structure that intersects from these same uh, dominative roots. Um, roots that, as I'm sure our, our panelists are aware, is integral in understanding the climate crisis and also important to understand and know when collaborating with organizations and groups on campus or off campus. 
Um, and I'm very excited to hear our panelists that are here today with us. Um, so, and I'm excited to hear uh, your work in climate advocacy. So let's start off with uh, Layla. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm Layla, I use she, her pronouns. I'm entering my third year majoring in environmental biology and environmental geography. Um, and I'm serving as the sustainability commissioner at VUSAC, which is the Victoria University Students Administrative Council. I always forget that because it's very long. Um, and so the commission basically operates in a role that's very parallel to what Sophia described um, at UC Lit, it's just at Vic. Um, and I've worked with the commission personally over the past two years as a general member and a co-chair. Um, and through my position, I think I primarily focused on affecting change at Vic. Um, so primarily at the college level or more specifically at the federated college level, which kind of introduces some unique challenges um, into the mix. And um, I also operate just within the broader Vic Student Council, which means I work sometimes on other student governance initiatives within VUSAC. And now let's hear from Grace and Chengxi. Hey everyone, hello from Winnipeg. I'm Grace, I go by she, her, and I'm heading into my fourth year at the Faculty of Arts and Science. I'm double majoring in English and uh, environmental science. Also, I'm not sure where to look. <laughs> so I'm one of the co-presidents for UTEA, which stands for University of Toronto Environmental Action, along with Chen Chi. So at UTEA, we do a lot of policy-based work and obviously environmentally based. Uh, raising pressing, raising awareness and um, committing to action on pressing environmental issues, including and not limited to indigenous water rights, sustainable energy and climate change. And yes, yeah, so overall, we advocate for more effective government policies to address these issues at the municipal, provincial and federal level. And we also work on campus sustainability policies as well. Yeah, like Grace said, um, I hope you guys are all having a good night. Um, I'm Chensi. Uh, she or pronouns are fine. So I'm going into my fourth, um, thankfully, last year at UFT. Um, so I'm doing a double major in political science and environmental studies with a minor in environmental ethics. Um, so UTEA, as Grace said, we really try to translate policy learning into action, like with me in political science. I really didn't know how to you know, use the learning that I did um, and put that into action and try to make sense of how to, you know, do more. So I think that UTEA really tries to encourage students to use what they learn in class and to, you know, use this learning platform that we have to try and stand against injustice and environmental degradation. And now let's hear from uh, Christine and Julia. Uh, good evening, everyone, or good morning, where Chen Chi is, or good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, my name's Christine. She, her, or they, them pronouns are cool. Um, and first, I want to thank Sophia, Alex, and UC Lit for inviting us here today. Um, just a warning, I'm not qualified to talk about any of these things, so take my words with like a grain of salt. But um, I just graduated from U of T, completing a double major in environmental science and environmental geography with a minor in urban studies. I've been organizing with LEAP since my second year, so a little over three years now. Um, LEAP UFT is the University of Toronto chapter of the global climate justice organization, the LEAP, which works on environmental justice through an intersectional anti-capitalist and anti-colonial lens. Um, since 2017, we've been running the fossil fuel divestment campaign at U of T, and I've organized multiple rallies, solidarity actions, and educational events um, across campus and beyond campus. Um, there's no hierarchy at LEAP, so everyone kind of does a bit of everything, which can sound a bit chaotic, but we do have some cool subcommittees, such as anti-racist organizing and a book club to give us some structure, but not a lot. Oh, forgot I was muted. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Julia. Um, I also use uh, she, her pronouns, um, and I just uh, graduated from philosophy and literature and critical theory. I'm also here with Leap, so Christine's already done our intro for that. Um, but I'll also just mention that uh, I'm on the board of OPERG Toronto, um, which is an environmental and social justice organization that supports a number of groups of action groups on campus, including Leap. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about uh, some of the things that we've picked up organizing with Leap over the past few years. Awesome, thanks, Julia. Um, thank you again to everyone for being here today. Um, so without any further ado, uh, we'll get started with some questions. Uh, Alex, take it away. All right. Um, I think it's uh, proper to start off with just 
asking, how did you guys get involved in climate activism? So let's start with Layla. How did you get involved in climate activism? Yeah, so I think throughout high school, I had been involved with a lot of clubs and causes that were focused on like traditional aspects of sustainability. Um, so those things being like park rehabilitation and conservation work. And I helped run my club, high school zero waste club. Um, but I don't think it was until I entered university that I really started to think more seriously about climate activism. I think my growing interest over the past two years has certainly been fueled by just the ability to interact and learn from individuals within the climate advocacy and activism communities across campus and in Toronto. Um, but it's also been supported, I think, by global movements um, such as the protests in September um, and Fridays for Future. So. Thank you. Um, and Grace, how about you? So I started more also, uh, actually untraditionally. So I uh, started in grade 10 as kind of a climate denier because my geography teacher was a climate denier. Anyway, so thankfully I had like progressive high school friends to like pull me out of that, but it, it made me very humble. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully I still am. But yeah, so I'd say in high school, just learning about it mostly through coursework and um, some of my friends were in our schools like environmental action club. And I think the experience that really made me think more deeply about the environment in general, like on both a scientific level and like a philosophical level is in before grade 12, I went on a research trip to the tundra. So in Northern Manitoba, where there's like polar bears and, and no trees. And that was a really formative experience. And then in university, I was looking through clubs and uh, Utea really caught my eye. And um, thankfully I got in and that's so, yeah, that's where I started. And I'm still like really just at the beginning and still learning lots always. Thank you. Um, and Cheng Shi, what about, what about you? How did you get involved? Yeah, um, so I think I didn't really have the traditional like um, experience growing up because I grew up in Canada, but then I went to high school um, in an international school in China. So growing up there was kind of different. I didn't really learn about like activism until really until university. Um, I used to do a lot of volunteering for like environmental clubs and like Roots and Shoots was big in my school. So there was like things like that, but it didn't really translate into activism until really when I went to university. Um, and obviously in China, free speech isn't really something that's promoted. So nothing like protesting would really be allowed. It wasn't really talked about. So I think that was definitely eye opening when I, you know, would see these protests mostly of America because you know their protests are like infamous um but I remember seeing the time when Trump was elected and all those protests happening and then when he pulled out of the Paris agreement and also those protests and yeah that really just like made a mark on me I was like oh you know people do this and like you know people's voices get hurt so yeah I think that definitely made a mark on all of us that tr Trump's actions <laughs> yeah for sure <laughs> Um, and um, Christine, I understand you're a part of LEAP. Uh, how did you get involved with them? Um, I think this will be a surprise to people who know me now, but I was very apolitical in high school in first year. Um, I didn't really have a like a rel relevatory moment where I was like, I want to be involved in this. It's kind of just looking for something to do in second year, um, like to join a club. And I kind of just stumbled upon LEAP's page on like the U of T club's website. I think it was like completely by accident. And like I read their mission statement, which was around fossil fuel divestment, which was something I'd never really heard about or like got involved with before um so kind of just getting pulled into that world out of like sheer curiosity and three years later i'm still here thank you um and julia how did you get involved with the climate activism yeah i mean like christine i was not really like politicized at all in high school or at least like i wasn't involved in kind of any activism or organizing so i would like read a lot of politics, but I had no kind of sense of how that like translated into action in any way. Um, so I think by the time I got to university, I was feeling like very overwhelmed and helpless at the state of the world. Um, Cause I had some inklings of like, wow, capitalism is destroying the planet, but had no sense that there was like a movement of any kind. Um, and then I happened to be on 350.org's mailing list in the fall of first year. And I got this email about this big like anti-Kinder Morgan action that was taking place in Ottawa. 
Um, so I got on a bus to Ottawa with a bunch of strangers um, who ended up being the people who like introduced me to climate organizing. And it was like, oh my God, like there are all these other people who like care about this enough to like do more than, I don't know, like collect recycling in school. Um, so that was a like really kind of important moment for me. And that was, I mean, that was the fall that like Trump was elected and everything was like chaos. And suddenly we were hearing about like fascism as like a real thing that still existed. Um, and the leap was really was getting going um and it was also the previous fossil fuel divestment campaign had gotten its rejection um that spring so that group was pretty inactive on campus um so a friend and i kind of like not realizing what we were getting ourselves into um <laughs> decided to start a leap chapter um and it's been like a long learning process from there <laughs> thank you um and i think sophia uh do you have any questions you'd like to say um, no, just thank you for uh, talking about your backgrounds, guys. Um, I think this kind of goes to show that uh, student climate activists definitely come from um, all types of different backgrounds. Um, so everyone who's watching, don't feel intimidated. Like it's really hard because sometimes you just stumble into it and you end up staying. Um, yeah. So for our next question, um, obviously our current context within the pandemic is affecting everyone, uh, some more than others. So Layla, why do you think uh, climate activism is especially important now? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think given kind of the zoonotic origins of this pandemic has like, they've shown us more than any other time in the past century that the consequences of climate change are here and they're everywhere. It's not just confined to coastal regions. It's not just a problem in countries that don't have the resources to combat it. It's a problem everywhere and it affects everyone. Um, you know, it's clear greenhouse gas emissions lead to climate change, which lead to loss of biodiversity, which lead to zoonotic diseases, which impact humans. Um, and that's why we're kind of in the current situation um, that we are in the pandemic. Um, and as for activism, activism in the next several years, I think it's really clear that COVID-19 is going to be one of the defining moments of this decade, even though we're only in the first year of this decade. Um, and so we've been presented with this really unique opportunity to call for massive change and reform as we emerge from the pandemic. Um, a lot of the principles of which are kind of addressed in the Just Recovery Framework. And I think it's really important that we stay on top of our game right now in this very moment, because we're going through a whole time, this very, this time of immense reckoning, I think, not only with things like racial justice, but we have to find the intersections of those movements, I think, with, um, the climate justice movement and the climate and climate action. And I think that's why activism is the most important right now. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Grace, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I completely agree with Layla. Like this is a defining moment in this decade and perhaps hopefully maybe in our lifetime, hopefully we won't have this, you know, every decade unless it's necessary for the change. Um, yeah, so I agree. I think it's a time of like um, a lot of existential potential. Um, I mean, we're all sort of uh, stuck at home and it leaves a lot of time to think um, or you might not have time to think, which is also okay. Um, but yeah, um, it kind of offers us a preview of the damages and the tragedy and like the pausing of life that climate change could inflict on us and even worse and with ramifications that we might not even understand right now. Um, and I know this is overall more, um, we're talking like today on more like systematic levels of changes in activism, but I think for um, like developed societies, especially people from like the middle to upper class, it does also offer a preview of some individual sacrifices that will have to be made for um, a sustainable future. For example, like, you know, traveling just might have to be mandate like regulated, that there's just less traveling. So I'm speaking for a smaller, um, smaller um, preview of the population, but I probably you might identify in that population. So it is a very interesting time and important time. Yeah, for sure. Um, Chen Shi, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah. Um, to be like nitpicky about the question, I guess, I don't know if climate activism is honestly the most important right now to be discussing because I feel like it's a really good platform and it should be something that should be prioritized always 
climate change is obviously something that we all believe in and we all really strongly want to change. But I think that right now, um, climate activism is a really good way to make visible the multitude of intersecting issues and, you know, um, the priorities that just society needs to address right now. So obviously, like the Black Lives Matter movement and, you know, indigenous rights is a huge thing always in, in Canada and in America. But I think right now, especially during this pandemic and everything that we've seen going on, it's never been more apparent um, the continued existence of, you know, wealth inequality, neoliberal capitalism, white supremacy, racial injustice, all of these issues are so directly in conflict with everything that we want in society, including, you know, climate action and environmental restoration and eventually a societal just, re just recovery. So I think that when people talk about saving the planet right now, it really requires addressing and forever, I think it really requires addressing these injustices and battling with these larger, you know, intersecting issues that are always going to have an impact on the way we live. So I think that right now, climate justice and climate activism is a really great way to make that change happen and to make people realize what's really important. Yeah, for sure. Um, the climate emergency definitely is not um, separable from all of these civil and human rights issues as well. Um, speaking of which, I know LEAP is definitely involved in a lot of these um, intersectionalities with environmental advocacy. So Christine, do you also want to speak on this? Um, yeah, I think we're seeing in real time, like multiple cities, governments, provinces, whatever level you want to think about it, pulling back environmental regulations, you know, handing out billions in fossil fuel subsidies while cutting funding to essential services like education, and you know, essentially taking advantage of social distancing guidelines. Um, for example, Alberta tried to pass a law essentially making it illegal to protest the construction of pipelines. So in this particular moment, I think it's really important to show governments and corporations that we're still paying attention and we're not okay with them exploiting a pandemic to build unnecessary fossil fuel infrastructure and like further entrenching us in this world based on extraction. Yes, very, very true. Um, Julia, you had something to add to that. Yeah, yeah. So like, so as Christine was saying, I think like really broadly, like we're seeing right now, um, obviously that corp like corporations and just the powers um, that be in general um, are working really hard to figure out how to exploit this moment of crisis. Um, so they, these are all, and a lot of these are the same kind of tactics um, that have been used for years, um, taking any crisis and using it to push through um, either whether fossil fuel subsidies, um, regulations that hurt our ability to organize. Um, but these are all kind of really being flung into relief right now at this moment where, you know, we have a decade really to like get on track um, to avert absolute like climate catastrophe. Um, so uh, it's really important um, in this moment that we're, um, yes, like continuing to do like climate activism, but also making sure that as we're doing that, we're doing it in a way where we're working against all of the manifestations of how that this crisis is being exploited in order to get to a just recovery. So climate activism is, is an, a really important part of that, um, but it's also a moment um, when climate activists really have to learn, uh, if we haven't already, how to show up for other parts of the movement, like Black Lives Matter, um, like all the other ways in which people are organizing for a just recovery. I think that's very, I think that's a very interesting point because I think it does tie in a bit with the Green New Deal that was proposed because that definitely talks about um, kind of a bottom up approach, making sure that all these facets of society are being considered when you're approaching the climate crisis. So I think that's very interesting. Um, and now I just like to ask, so what challenges have uh, you guys faced as climate activists and how did you overcome them? I mean, I know it's definitely very hard to get involved in activism and to stay motivated to sustain that kind of um, passion towards activism. So I just want to know, how did you guys, how were your challenges? So let's start with uh, Chen Shi. Um, yeah, so I think that I just really had to realize that, you know, being a climate activist, I guess, and working in this field means that you have to oftentimes accept um, disappointing outcomes 
you know, in climate advocacy, sometimes the policies that you want to advocate for or that you really believe should be changed don't end up being changed and governments just don't listen or there's, you know, there's no outcome or just disappointing outcomes from what you've been trying to work on. Um, and I think overcoming this is pretty difficult. I'm pretty sure all of us can kind of relate. It's not easy, you know, to feel like you didn't really make a difference as much as you wanted to. But I think that um, personally being having the background that I have and knowing that a lot of people don't have voices, like billions of people in this world can't even speak out at all, you know, they'll probably get arrested or you know worse they could never be found never have a fair trial that is truly scary to me and i think that's what motivates me to do what i do as well because i know that i have this luxury that a lot of people in the world are not afforded so you know it makes me more appreciative of my position it makes me aware that i can't just stand by and i should use this platform because it's not given to just everyone i think i think that's a very interesting point when you said that um, there's, you know, people keep on pursuing, even if they don't really see any outcome. I think that it shows that within um, the community of activists, that there's always this kind of passion and hope that I think can be really important towards inspiring other people. And um, so Layla, what would you um, comment on this point? Yeah, so I feel like, especially in the past year, my experience with working with university administration has been, or specifically administration at Vic, um, is that as an institution, a lot of people who represent that institution are not opposed to things like baseline sustainability initiatives. It's just that they don't sense the same sort of urgency that I think our generation really senses um, in relation to the climate crisis. And so they're a lot slow a lot more slower moving on larger climate actions, things like divestment. Um, so ultimately a lot of my work, especially in the past year has really just been focusing on pushing the administration to take like baby steps forward. Um, so things like highly visible sustainable measures like composting, but even implementing things like that can be really difficult on campus. Um, you know, you can meet with a member of the administration and they're like, yeah, I love the idea of composting, that's great. But then they, they don't really take the right steps there and they might not implement it the way that you want it implemented. So I think that is another challenge that I faced is kind of presenting an idea to um, staff and administration and that idea kind of being wrenched from student control and morphed into something that the administration would prefer or would be easier for them to implement. And so making sure that student control is very key in the way that your like the initiative continues and is laid out is has been a challenge I think over the past year um, and yeah I mean being in meetings sometimes it can be kind of disenchanting to feel like it's almost like a us versus them sort of situation and I think it's really hard to reconcile that and to make sure that you're still taking as many steps forward as you can without having to take too many steps backwards and making sure that you're still making progress even though it's very incremental um, but ultimately I think overcoming that challenge is about realizing that your worth and power as a student. Um, you know, we pay fees to the university. We technically, there's more of us than there are any adults or administration at the university. And ultimately that goes towards giving us like the power in the room sometimes. Um, and yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely true that the people do have power, but I think that everyone here agrees that there is definitely, a, administrative barriers that always need to be knocked through. So Grace, yeah, sure. have you encountered any barriers like this as well? Yeah, well, first of all, shout out to Layla and like the whole Vic Zero team for releasing a super uh, comprehensive draft on um, uh, for on how to transform sustainability at Vic. Um, yeah, that, that's really great. Um, I would say, um, I, I completely agree with both Chenchi's and Layla's point. There's administrative barriers and there's there's barriers everywhere. And I'm thinking of the like the digital barriers. And I think we no longer live just we don't I don't think the main saying should be like we live in an age of information. I think it's like we live in an age of disinformation, which really concerns me um, and makes me personally feel like I 
I'm not sure. Like, I feel like it's climate change and all the intersecting issues are very complex and can be easily manipulated. Um, so I think that's a challenge for me. I mean, I was a climate denier, denier in grade 10. So as you can see, people can be easily manipulated and um, um, convinced of certain ideas. So I'm, I think a challenge right now is like how we approach climate change and climate information digitally. And in terms of overcoming that, I think, I guess on a personal level, it's like critical thinking, um, reflecting on your own biases, but there needs to be like more systematic, systematic changes, like, you know, checking if the information is factually correct, cough, cough, Facebook. Um, but yeah, that's what I'll say. Thank you, that, that was really insightful. And um, Julia, um, would you like to also comment on any challenges that you've experienced? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm going to start like really basic and talk about time. Um, <laughs> Cause you know, in like at U of T and you know, in under living under capitalism in general, um, we are, there's a lot of pressure to, uh, to be hyper productive. Um, and it's really easy for an institution like U of T um, in, to kind of consume all of your time, your whole, your entire soul. Um, and then it feels like, you know, you really have to justify um, any time spent doing anything else, which is really hard when you're trying to like situate yourself in this long haul struggle against the fossil fuel industry and capitalism. And it feels like the things that you're doing, you know, all of the, the individual, the small little things will never be enough. Um, so I guess find, figuring out how, what, so one like kind of really important like learning uh, step for me was fig figuring out that like how spending a certain amount of time, just like deciding you're gonna spend, a, you know, however much time you can engaged in something that feels meaningful aside from like academics or all these kind of like check mark resume things um, actually like helps you ultimately um, function better um, in like the rest in the rest of your life um, when you feel like you're doing meaningful work and you are doing meaningful work and then on the flip side of that um, kind of coming to know your own capacities um, to avoid burnout because like the flip side of like that hyperproductive culture that keeps you from doing activism is also like the hyperproductive culture where you try to give more of your time than you can um, <laughs> so figuring out a balance that like lets you feel like you're you know spending your time meaningfully, but that you can like continue to give from yourself. Um, and also, and I get the other kind of main thing um, is I guess imposter syndrome. It's like feeling like I'm not qualified to be talking about or doing any of this um, because in general, we're like not taught, um, like none of us are qualified for this. Like none of us, we're not like taught system systematically how to like, you know, cr make meaningful change for like a very, specific reason. Um, so kind of learning how to be patient with yourself and having this like personal commitment to like reading and learning um, and really like allowing this like slow process of, of building confidence um, and feeling more capable and listening and learning constantly from others who've been doing the work. Um, and like just knowing that if you're genuinely kind of coming into the work with good intentions, I mean, you're committed to doing the necessary learning and unlearning um, but there is space and time for you to be part of this work. Thank you. That, that was insightful. I, I, I agree with what you said about all, like feeling like you're an imposter and like this huge crowd of people activating. I, I know I can relate to that sometimes. Um, but I think you brought up a very important point that sometimes you do feel like it's just you. But I guess that's like the beauty of activism. It's that it's not just you, right? Like there's many, many people. Um, that care about, about what you care about. Um, and on that note, Christine, how do you stay motivated amongst um, your own challenges with activism? Um, I think two feelings I resonate with really hard or a lot of young people are being like being overwhelmed and like a sense of nihilism. So it's easy to fall into this mindset that like nothing matters and we're all going to die anyway. You know, like doomerism is like a big thing now. But um, this kind of works to the advantage of those in power, right? Like they want you to feel hopeless and constrained so that you don't act against them. And, you know, when I think about it like that, I don't really want to be doing the enemy's work for them. So kind of just like shifting my mindset. But also I think 
giving myself permission to let my imagination expand and like imagine a different world, like asking myself questions like, what does a world not built on fossil fuel extraction look like? And like, why is that a world I wanna live in and how can we get to that world? Um, and I think another big challenge for me was like not coming from an organizing or political background, like I mentioned in my introduction. So I think continuing to show up and do the work, especially doing the work in a supportive community, kind of helps you build that foundation or that background. And, you know, as a child of immigrants, we're kind of taught to like not act out of line or like don't get in trouble by going to protest. Um, so my advice for people is just to keep doing it until your mom just has to accept that this is your life and these are your decisions. And just remember to always text her that you're being safe, as safe as possible, and like force her to attend all your webinars so you come to a mutual understanding. Like don't try to get your parents into activism, but like understand why you're doing activism. I think that really helps you know, build your confidence as an organizer. Yeah, for sure. Um, Christine, I definitely can relate to like the whole uh, nihilism bit, um, especially coming from, you know, um, Asian immigrant family, like nothing just really seems to matter. Um, uh, actually, along the same vein, um, in terms of like nihilism, the kind of like outlook on, you know, the climate emergency and climate activism um, is that, you know, the facts are oftentimes super grim, like what Julie mentioned earlier, like we have a decade um, to get it together. Otherwise, like we, or even shorter, it's, probably, it's happening now, um, before climate catastrophe happens everywhere. So how do you, how does everyone here think, uh, how do we get the youth involved in climate activism when the facts are in fact super grim? Um, in other words, how do you kind of step out of that cognitive dissonance and how do you suggest others also find motivation to do the same? Um, we can start with Grace. Yeah, so I not, I'm definitely like still within this cloud of cognitive dissonance. I don't know if we'll ever be able to step out of it. So I guess it's trying to hone that momentum from the cognitive dissonance as abstract as that, as that sounds. I'm personally not, yeah, I think I think actually like getting involved will will help you will help one feel better. I mean it might not make you feel less grim, but it might make you feel more hopeful as well as feeling like the same amount of grimness. Um, hopefully you'll feel feel less grim as well, but I think it's understandable if you aren't, um, especially in these sort of such uncertain and and tragic, but with with lots of with a lot of hope. I think there's just so many, like the spectrum of emotion is just huge right now. So I'm not sure if I'm the best person to answer the question of stepping out of cognitive dissonance. I'm still learning, and I think like attending these webinars and hearing you guys talk is like very inspirational, and makes me feel like you know if I'm not in a good space, there's like so many other people still doing the work and I can just like jump back in when I'm um, feeling better again. Yeah, for sure. Um, we're super glad to have you here. Um, definitely and also hear from you, uh, no matter how much you say that uh, you're learning, you definitely have valuable insights to contribute as well. Um, Christine, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I think the facts seem a lot more grim when you consider the climate crisis in isolation from everything. Um, versus understanding that the climate crisis is a part of a much broader struggle against a system that is not set up like that is set up to not work for most people. Um, you know, the climate crisis is not an abstract thing that's like looming in the background or far away in the future. There are very concrete struggles playing out right now, which we can focus on. So, for example, when we bring attention to those protesting against the construction of pipelines, people can easily become involved with physically and materially supporting those on the front lines. You know, makes you feel productive, makes you feel like you're doing something. I mean, you know, once you're doing this intersectional climate justice work where you're also engaged with all the struggles connected to the climate movement. So for example, the labor movement, um, migrant justice, even if we don't get a win per se for the climate movement, such as like stopping the construction of a pipeline, there's still a lot of work being done that's making people's lives materially better. So for example, trying to improve housing conditions for migrant workers, status for all, you know, trying to get your workplace unionized. Um, you know, Fudora couriers were in the process of getting their union certified until they, like Fudora pulled out of Canada. So like, just like when you take those as like wins for the climate movement, like makes you feel a little better. Um, and you know, understanding there's no solving the climate crisis, like we're already living in it and it's already happening. It's not in like all or nothing game. There are multiple ways we can avert the crisis. Like in other words, there are still many ways it can be less bad and we shouldn't just give up because we can't solve it completely in like one shot. 
you know, for example, our work, fossil fuel divestment won't necessarily solve the world's addiction to fossil fuels, but there's still that removal of social capital from the fossil fuel industry, which means they no longer have the power to do whatever they want to people and land. And, you know, in this, in the end, this is part of a broader shift of power away from corporations and nation states built on extractive economies. For sure. Um, all awesome points. Um, Chen Xi, uh, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, you know, in full agreement with what everyone else has said so far. I think that looking at the facts are definitely grim, but when you think about what would happen if you didn't do anything, I think that's a good motivator because you realize that, you know, there's sometimes I feel like people think that there's already enough voices in the climate movement. Cause sometimes I think that like, you know, you feel like you're already, you're, you're already being represented. You know, a lot of people feel like Greta Thunberg is like, you know, the poster child for activism and she's doing all the work and we don't, you know, sometimes I feel like that personally. So I, I kind of started to understand that there is a need for multiple voices in the, you know, in the sphere of, of climate activism. And there's a need for, you know, so many different perspectives that are not just not just one person's perspective. So I think that when you think about, you know, the work that you can put in and the fact that there's no other way really, because, you know, the facts are just gonna be there. They're, they're not going away. So you can either contribute or you can just, you know, sit by and see if, you know, if things change, I feel like the first option is definitely. Awesome, yeah, I especially like your point um, where we need to incorporate um, a lot of different voices and not just one, um, especially considering kind of the diversity of, you know, our generation and the younger people. Um, so Layla, uh, do you have anything to talk about in concerning our generation of youth? Yeah, I think, um, well, going off a little bit of what Grace said, I definitely think I have not personally stepped out of cognitive dissonance as well. I think it's a difficult thing. And I also don't think that it's necessarily entirely possible to step out of it. Um, I think sometimes it is in a way a motivating factor and I think it does drive us sometimes. And so stepping out of it and just living in complete acceptance isn't always the best thing either. Um, but, and then building off of what Christine said, I think for me, um, trying to step out of that as much as possible was really getting involved with things and surrounding yourself with people who are working towards a similar cause. And I think by doing that, it, yeah, it makes you more hopeful. I think you can see that there are all these great people around you doing great things and believe in the same things. And to have those people by your side and to stand next to those people and to work with them towards a common cause, I think is what really help is, is what can help you not forget about those grim facts, but feel a little bit more hopeful in the face of those grim facts. Thank you, Layla, that, that, that was very interesting. Um, I think that we do have the powers of people and based off of all your answers, it seems that climate activism is not just caring about how often you get knocked down, it's about having a goal and you know, being determined to achieve it. Um, and on another point, um, I'd like to just ask if what your opinions are in terms of, um, do you feel that by recognizing the intersectionality of climate change, you can create more climate activism. So do you feel that there should be less distance between advocacy clubs or groups? So uh, let's start with uh, Grace. What are your opinions? Yes. And I think we've, we've made that like clear throughout this whole, um, throughout this whole webinar so far that it's such an intersectional issue. And I know, I feel like I mentioned the study to like everyone I meet, cause I got like really excited seeing it, but it was a study that asked experts to rank the 17 uh, United Nations Sustainability Development Goals, SDGs, in order of priority. So how they think the, um, how, like, in what, like, order do you think we should tackle these goals so that it's, like, the most efficient? Um, and climate action uh, ranks behind 10 other SDGs, including reducing inequality, um, eliminating poverty, and gender equality. So I think it's important to keep in mind as we've talked about in this webinar already that it's like by working to meet these um, intersecting goals, we are working directly and indirectly for climate action. And I think hopefully just that awareness will bring more advocacy clubs and groups together to work more together. And I think that like 
overall what we're doing with the climate movement is envisioning a different kind of future than the one we have right now. And envisioning a future is everything and is everyone. And it's also okay that if you're at like a different timeline of your envisioning, um, we all start somewhere. Um, and so as, as long as you're thinking about it, I think it's really cool. Um, yeah, and it's, I think it's that envisioning that's really important. Yeah, I think that awareness is, is definitely key. Um, and I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on this, Julia. Yeah, definitely. Um, I love um, your point, Grace, about like sustainability um, and like what we imagine like sustainability to mean. Um, and there, so like I, I, I think like as everyone's mentioned, I've uh, mentioned many times tonight, like because there's no addressing the climate crisis without kind of understanding the systems of oppression that make it possible. Um, and these all work together to make a completely unsustainable state of affairs on any number of levels. Um, so like capitalism, colonialism, um, racism, patriarchy, all of these work together to make people and land expendable for profit, um, kind of at a, a really fundamental level. Um, so once, and, and, and then, so, so there's that, but then like once we like know that all of these struggles are interconnected and like crit and critically interconnected, um, things are just like better when, um, when you have comrades, um, when we kind of understand um, that we're like really all part, like that anyone doing this kind of like radical work is um, in a broader struggle and that we're just like doing different parts of the same work and focusing on different aspects of fighting the same system of power. Um, and I think like we're already seeing even at U of T, um, like on, on campus, um, the kind of distance between groups being closed um, in the past few years. Like, I don't know, it feels more um, connected um, even like when compared to when I was in first year. Um, but, and, and I think sometimes climate activism at U of T can seem like it's in a separate sphere from a lot of the other um, campus movement, the rest of like the, the campus movement. Um, but there's always been relationships between um, campus, uh, like more like left campus organizations, um, for example. Um, and I think really it's like now the responsibility of climate groups that maybe have a history of not always having been involved with other parts of the struggle to really start to do the work of building those relationships. Um, and that's already really happening. Um, we saw that really especially happening starting with like the climate strikes in September. Um, and this is also something that we should be pushing for from our student unions. Um, so like if our student unions, um, but like looking at the UTSU, um, uh, weren't often so centrist um, and so like trying to be a political part of their function would be this like coalition building that needs to happen um, so I don't know that's like another thing to keep in mind thank you um, thank you Julia uh, I, I yeah I agree I think that collaboration between groups um, is very important and um, I liked what you said about groups finally recognizing that connection I think that's like very exciting to see that happen um, and on that note, Layla, how do you feel um, about um, advocacy groups on campus? Do you think there's exclusion of any kind? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important for different groups to work on different intersections than others, because otherwise sometimes groups just devolve into being like a one issue group and that can be really difficult organizationally. But ultimately, I think it's absolutely imperative that as a movement, um, we recognize intersectionality of climate change as a whole. Climate change, you know, it isn't just a problem, a science problem for scientists. Um, it's not like things like bioengineering are going to solve this crisis. Like Julia said, it's about dismantling the systems that uphold climate change, systems like racism and capitalism. And recognizing that, I think, is the ultimate purpose of this movement and must be. Um, and so I think um, working with other organizations. Um, it's, it, it increases the number of people that we get to work with and that we get to stand next to. Um, and kind of going back to the last question, I think have, being surrounded by an even larger community and expanding that community, I think helps us to step out of that cognitive dissonance. Um, so I don't think we're ever gonna benefit from exclusion of particular identities or particular intersectionalities. And I, I think that it's absolutely imperative that we, we recognize intersectionality, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was, that was really well said. Yeah, I, I mean, those are some very good points. Um, and what, what about um, you, Chenshi? What, what, do you, what do you think? Um, 
in the interest of time, because I know we're running a little over and because all of the people that spoke before me, including Layla and Julia and Grace, um, you guys all did great. I think I would just say yes. I think that there should be less distance <laughs> between advocacy groups and um, leave it at that. Awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's actually uh, the end of the questions that we had prepared. Um, thank you everyone for answering so well and being so articulate and well-spoken. Um, we did get a few audience questions uh, during this panel, so I'm going to um, ask them kind of in order of, you know, yeah, what I thought was like more relevant to our discussion where we left off. Um, I guess uh, for the first one that I saw was actually directed for Layla. Um, so this is a VIC student that recently graduated and they ask, uh, they ask, how can we continue to strive for um, these larger kind of intersectional changes um, despite the rejection that often occurs at like an administrative level? Um, and they pointed out that even trying to get green bins in residences has been an absolute hassle. So uh, Leila, how would you go about that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and that's a question that I still struggle with a lot. Um, I think there's kind of a couple things on this. One is just get as many people involved as possible because I think when you just have, when you have power in numbers, like it just helps you achieve those larger initiatives because you can rally support not only from like the general student body, but like within your own organization, you can say, hey, I have 20 people working on this project. Why can't we get it done? Um, so that's one part of it. And I think another part is, I mean, like I said, I don't have a perfect answer to this, but one thing that I think at the Sustainability Commission that we have kind of been doing over the past year or so is really just kind of working in tandem. So we carry out a lot of these smaller initiatives because we think they're important and they need to be implemented anyways. Um, but we also, alongside that, work on projects like Big Zero and try to create larger change at the same time. And trying to push both of those forward at the same time can be really difficult and it's more time consuming to kind of focus, have to focus on like four different things at once. Um, I think ultimately that's just how we've been doing it. And that's the, that's the best way to do it as of right now. Um, and that is definitely something that I think I have reflected on a lot, especially over the past, over the summer. Um, and yeah, I don't have a perfect answer, but that's at least how I do it. Yeah, for sure. Um, doing a lot of advocacy work, especially facing kind of this administrative um, barrier definitely is not easy, um, especially like Lila and I who are working um, at the college level. So we're trying our best, but we also definitely, like Layla said, don't have a perfect answer. Um, so the next question uh, comes from someone who says that uh, oftentimes they kind of find themselves frustrated at like anti-intellectual movements that seem somehow to be growing in popularity like the anti-vaxxer movement, like climate deniers, um, like most recently like the anti-mask people. Um, so kind of as an activist, how do you kind of engage in a productive conversation with these kinds of people to change their minds? Um, without being abrasive uh, or maybe like putting too much stress on yourself. Uh, Grace had some points on this, um, so feel free to talk about this. Yeah, I first wanted to say that according to new studies, apparently, if, at least for Americans, that the amount of climate deniers is actually decreasing. So um, that's that's a positive, but I don't know about the other, uh, like anti, I mean, anti-maskers obviously are increasing. So um I think there is some hope in, in, in the level of awareness of people, um, but there is obviously still a lot of uh, disagreement and dissonance. And I think like what I've learned from uh, growing also in a like immigrant household um, is that there's no point sort of just trying to say what you want to say. Like you have to meet people on their side, which is not something that I'm very good at. And like, again, I'm still working on that. But it is meeting people on their side because I, I think I often like I have antagonized people that don't have the same views as me. But when oftentimes when you like listen to them, like speak about why they don't have the same views, it's obviously not from a evil foundation or anything, which I think is is easy to easy an easy mindset to fall into, I think, in our digital age where we 
there's, I think it's very, it's just harder to empathize online. So I think on an individual level is meeting people on their side and having like more dialogue. And also on a more systematic uh, level is advocating for more humane technology, um, as I've mentioned previously, but that's another topic. Awesome. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, our next question comes from um, Sarah, who just wrote this in the chat. Um, how do we kind of avoid feelings of helplessness um, as an individual uh, with bigger issues like environmental racism and all, all of the other systemic uh, issues that we've mentioned um, that require things like legislation and the government and like a higher up kind of bureaucratic system to solve? Um, Chin Xie wrote some notes on this, um, followed by Christine. Yeah, so I think that really just requires looking at what's happening right now, because I think that all these issues are obviously really prominent, but sometimes, you know, there are certain issues that take prominence over others at certain times. Um, and I think that being aware that these issues could be addressed, you know, specifically during this time, and we can all address them together is a good thing to note, is the fact that, like, you're not the only one concerned, you're not the only one hopeless, that a lot of us are also feeling the same way, and that we're also trying to change things, you know, you know, in, in the same way, we want to, we want to, change these bigger issues and um, issues that you've raised up like environmental racism and other systemic issues are obviously things that we can't change in a day or in a week or maybe in a month um, while well, it's still going on. So yeah, so I think legislation can definitely change eventually, but it just requires making sure that you're on issues when they happen and making sure that you're working with other people and knowing that you're not alone and trying to change them. For sure. Uh, Christine, do you want to follow up on that? Um, yeah, just like about the point of higher ups, I think like using higher ups as an excuse to delay action is not the right way to go. So just like don't delay getting involved in activism because you're waiting or relying on higher ups to solve everything. Like neoliberal governments won't save us. They're entrenched in the same systems that we've talked about. Um, so I think, you know, with that feeling of like individualism or like hopelessness, I think hoping for that better world is what keeps me going you know like the only people who have our backs are like ourselves right so just like like helping me like get through all these challenging times um in a supportive community yeah for sure um the next question comes from our good friend sydney um she would like to see everyone kind of talk about maybe um greenwashing uh, at all levels of you know u of t government um from u of t admin down to uh, like student governments or course unions um, I can actually kind of start off on this. Um, like I mentioned before, the Sustainability Commission was kind of known before as like a, ooh, like cute DIY event and like BYOCs and like, you know, that sort of thing. And while I think that's like, you know, great and cute and fun and like accessible, um, that's ultimately not exactly uh, what I think we could be using our resources, our money and our voices and our power as student government to um, be doing. Uh, so Julia or Christine, I think you guys should have some thoughts on this, especially um, with regards to maybe like divestment, um, release of, you know, the ESGs. Uh, would you guys like to talk about that a little bit? I can talk about it. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is like a huge thing um, that we deal with with the fossil fuel divestment campaign, um, because as I mentioned, um, when LEAP started, um, you, we, uh, the previous divestment campaign had just gotten its projection, um, and you have kind of used that opportunity to instead create this like responsible investing um, plan that did absolutely nothing to like change the you know, material realities of what it's invested in, um, and mostly just served as like a way for the university to like project itself. Um, as this uh, present itself as like environmentally conscious in order to gain legitimacy um, because like in this era of climate crisis um, you need to like pretend that you're doing enough um, in order to like to gain the amount of legitimacy that you need to like keep being profitable um, but you can't um, you know you can't do anything to like say actually challenge the power of the fossil fuel industry um, or you're going to or you're, you're going too far um so that's so i think that's like a really important thing as we're like doing cl climate activism is we have to be watching kind of 
who is who is like primarily benefiting um from any um what, what's the word i'm looking for from from any like initiative or any like um uh policy that's or any like policy that's put forward and if the primary primary people are benefiting are like the institution that gets to like brand itself in a certain way without having any kind of real responsibility um then that's like a point where we need to be really focused on shifting um the narrative that it's propagating yeah for sure i think that yeah that's a that's a good point that's been made um and just to follow up on that do you um i'm just going to kind of open the floor to anyone who wants to answer this question um do you feel like sometimes melody lee asks do you feel like sometimes you're not taken seriously as a young person or as a young activist that you don't have any as she close to like real qualifications um and how do you how do you deal with that so anyone can answer it here because that you are all young activists hmm. I think, I don't know, just like keep talking to people until they think you're smart is my advice. <laughs> like they're not going to know that you know these things until you like make it known that you know them. That, that was like a really convoluted way to say just like keep talking. <laughs> yeah, I have like another quick thought that I like to pull out, which is that like, you know, no matter how like young or legitimately unqualified we are, um, it's just like a matter of fact that like every previous generation has failed at like overthrowing capitalism and uh, solving the climate crisis. Um, so there's like real, so like, and, and at this point where we have like, you know, 10 years to avert catastrophic change, like there's really no, we're, whatever we're doing, we're kind of on the like moral high ground. Um, and there's, and and there's no one like there's there's no one who's like done it right on like a broad the broad like systematic level that we need to be getting to like we're all trying and learning um so i don't that's like i don't know that's a good one that i like pull out when like people my parents age especially <laughs> are like ah oh, like you're just a youth and i'm like the boomers yeah i'm like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, to add on to that point. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, no, you, you go. Yeah, just to add on to that point a little bit too, like I've definitely been told that I'm not qualified enough or I don't have like the expert knowledge to participate in certain meetings or like have a voice in certain places. Like I know specifically at Vic, like the investment committee as part of the Board of Regents has specifically like told certain students that like they don't have students on that committee because students aren't like well-versed in financial like jargon and like aren't professionals in that industry um and so like that's been very frustrating but um I think like what I've taken away from that is that adults don't know what they're doing any more than we do um I think everyone for their whole life to some degree puts on this like facade of like oh yeah I'm like professional I'm an expert like I know what I'm doing and yes there is like some degree of I think technical knowledge that people do acquire over the years but ultimately I think all of us are kind of just grasping in the dark sometimes and it's just about giving your best effort and like Christine said like just keep talking. Yeah I, I agree with that I mean as we all know adults are the one that signed the Paris Agreement and as we all know that has not been as helpful <laughs> towards getting to where we need to be. Um, so just to add on to the previous question um, how effective are how effective are individual actions would you say? Um, I actually have some points on that kind of uh, branching off of the greenwashing question. Um, I don't know, like attempts by corporations to kind of, you know, greenwash and like individualize the climate crisis kind of through, you know, encouraging individuals to, I don't know, like buy this sustainable thing or, you know, like use less plastic. And while I think there's definitely something to be said about like, you know, you know reducing consumerism, reducing our waste, and kind of like amplifying that like bottom up effect from the consumer up. Um, we have to be using our voices to demand for greater change because individualizing this issue kind of sheds the responsibility of sustainability onto consumers rather than kind of holding the big corporations and systems um, who are actually responsible, the majority of it um, accountable. So again, um, while I think, you know, individual actions like using 
uh, like your own, I don't, know, I don't know, like a metal straw, making your own like beeswax wraps. Well, I think that's like really cute and like good. And like, I think that's, you know, just a great activity in general. Um, we have to be kind of using our voices and our resources to be advocating for much more than that. Um, it can't just stop at, you know, lifestyle changes. Yeah. I think that's a very interesting point. I mean, you can't, um, by recycling, you can't change society and all its injustices. It's definitely, you have to um, approach it from more of a systematic approach, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, um, for sure. Um, I think that actually is the end of our questions. Um, I think I will end off with Sydney's questions uh, on, are there any cool environmental collabs coming up? And I think this is a good chance to kind of plug all of our events um, if we have any coming up. Um, for me personally, um, the UC Lit Sustainability Commission, along with Leap U of T, is holding a webinar in August, on August 18th, from 6 to 8 p.m. EDT, on the Green New Deal, as well as degrowth economics. We will be having some amazing speakers, and the discussion will be fantastic. So keep an eye out for that event when it comes out. Um, does anyone else have any events that they would like to plug? Um, otherwise, I think we're finishing up here. You can come to Leap's book club. I think the books we're reading for August are Unsettling Canada and Are Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis. So if you're interested in like police prison abolition, come join our book club um, events on Facebook. Yeah. I will post it in the chat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is not UTEA specific, but um, uh, the Committee on Environment, Climate Change and Sustainability, which is a university wide committee is holding a term long sustainability celebration. Um, so there's gonna be, I think a lots of, hopefully lots of student involvement. So we should all be like keeping an eye on that and seeing how we can like best participate and like organize like mass movements within, within the celebration too. So I think it's gonna be a very uh, transformational and unprecedented year. Cool. Last call for any more plugs. Otherwise, I think we're finished up. Great. Um, thank oh, wait, you again. Wait, one more. Oh. Melanie <laughs> just reminded me on YouTube. <laughs> so okay. um, next Wednesday in the afternoon, uh, Utea, along with um, some uh, members that went to uh, with ENSU and the Environmental Student Union and the School of Environment, were holding a webinar on COP, our experience at COP25. And it's about like who gets to tell the climate justice story. Um, and so we'll be summarizing like our experience at COP and like what we learned and all the dissonant um, things we learned about that experience. Awesome. Um, do you wanna actually, uh, wait, hang on, let me find the event. Um, I found it and I will throw it into the chat. Cool. Thanks, Sophia. Yep. Um, any last minute <laughs> events. <laughs> um, otherwise, yeah. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you for the audience who stuck till the end um, as we went over time. Um, we'll be posting kind of like a list of all of the resources that were mentioned today um, onto our Facebook event page, along with our uh, all of our socials um, in case any of you are now inspired and wanna reach out and get involved. Um, Otherwise, I hope everyone has a great evening and thank you again. Thank, thank you everyone for coming out. Thank you, Sophie and Alex. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you for coming. That was really informative. <laughs>